On this week's podcast, we cover the dangers of cooking meat with Dr. Connor Brady, one of the world's leading top animal nutritionists, and Dr. Nick Thompson, the head of the Raw Feeding Veterinary Society. It doesn't get better than that. Hi, so I'm with two amazing friends, Connor and Nick. Dr. Nick Thompson, head of the Raw Feeding Veterinary Society, easy for some to say, and Dr. Connor Brady, one of the world's leading animal nutritionists. Mm. Um, we're gonna cover a few topics right now. So, topic one, cooking protein. So, Connor, that you had a <laughs> you had a fabulous speech yesterday, uh, a lecture in which you covered some of the issues with cooking protein and why ultimately raw feeding is best. Can you share with our viewers, please, some of the top reasons that cooking protein is quite dangerous? Yeah, for sure. I, I think. Um it, 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 certainly the first thing would be like how you cook the protein what are we talking about here it's not like the average punter at home has a little extruder cooker uh, when, we, when we look at some of the most harmful effects of cooking proteins we're talking some really harsh temperatures and pressures kibble for example when protein is subjected to really high temperatures you get off a range of issues you get proteolysis where the amino acids break down you get cross-linking where the protein is put into different forms but one of the biggest ones that we were speaking about uh, yesterday was uh, Maillard reactions, which is the bonding of sugar onto protein and fat. And you can smell those Maillard reactions when you're barbecuing your steak, that lovely aroma. Yep. That's a Maillard reaction that particle. Uh, those little black lines you see, they're yep. Maillard reactions. When your egg goes from clear to kind of white on the pan, that's yep. Maillard. When you overcook your steak on the barbecue and you're tough and you can't chew it properly, that's a Maillard reaction. It makes stuff hard to digest, so that's the number one number one issue. It makes uh, makes meat protein hard to digest, and that's assuming that that you're starting with good protein in the first place. But the yeah. thing is, when you when when you when you're going to make kibble, when any of these big companies oh, make yeah, kibble, yeah. they start with meat meal, which exactly. has already been processed well, and has been subject to temperature and pressure in yes. order to produce this meal so that it can cross continents. Yeah. They, so call, they call it meat meal but it's meat and, bo meat and bone meal. So there you it go. comes from the rendering plant as a lovely grey flour so it's already been heat annihilated mm. Mm. and then you put it through the extrusion process which has two or three cooking steps in it. Yeah. Pre-cooking, cooking, and drying. So that sort of protein studies show uh, is, is a bit of an issue. So they measure the amount of MRPs in our food and you don't want MRPs in your food. I'm sorry, what are MRPs? Uh, Maillard reaction particles so it's the bits that are formed from these Maillard reactions there's lots of them one of the famous ones is acrylamide so we hear of this in cooking potato chips and uh, even coffee or anything that turns food very brown can be acrylamides so what we're saying as well is if I understand acrylamides are hugely linked with cancer Absolutely. and acrylamides are hugely present in highly processed foods is yes, that correct that, that's, that's it in a nutshell absolutely and they first detected acrylamides by analyzing them not first detected but the primary way they did it was comparing wild animals to pet animals and they saw that pet animals had huge amounts of acrylamides ah. and they said oh there's number one kind of issue to, to look at Acrylamide, isn't that what they make plastics out of? Acrylamide? Uh, it kind of sounds like something yeah, that should be yeah, in plastic. Yeah. Could be, I don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah. I wouldn't know the, the. So, if we were to recap that, what we're actually saying is that feeding pets highly processed, or the term we were introduced to yesterday, ultra processed food, yeah. is actually. Uh, potentially a major cause of cancer. That's a, that's a, the studies are absolutely showing that. I mean, as I, I went through the studies yesterday, it's not something that we think is happening. It's absolutely linked to, they would suspect, okay, you can't say absolutely, but absolutely correlated with disease and pets and cancer would be one of them. But it's not just uh, acrylamides, there's AGESs, uh, ages that, that, that Susan Wynn was talking about. There um, is HCAs, which are the big problem. So uh, just to, for anybody who's not familiar with ages, these are advised, advanced glycation end products and they are literally associated with cell aging and death. Absolutely and if I, if I remember correctly that's the carb being stuck onto the, the lipid essentially as opposed exactly. to the protein in this case but all from the same heat process and it's one of the reasons we're told not to eat this processed high intensity um, ultra processed food because of the formation of these MRPs but they're so prevalent in pet food 
uh, up to 122 times in some of the studies, the level of MRPs in pet food and what humans are exposed to. And that's just the first reason that cooking protein is bad. So, so 125 c- times more uh, cancer-causing, age-enhancing, uh, life-threatening in, oh, I think we're about to be hit by a car. Uh, <laughs> 125 times more cancer-causing, uh, life-threatening, cellular death-promoting agents in pet food than in the human supply. Absolutely. So let's just recap what we've got here. We're saying that cooking protein actually denatures yep. it and yep. makes it much harder for the dog and the human to digest. And cats. Yep. And cats. It can change the shape of the protein it can cross bind with either sugar or fat to create cancer causing agents such as acrylamides yeah. uh, we've got ages in there and i also heard some people speaking yesterday about how cooking protein can actually be a major cause or or causal factor in creating food intolerances and allergies that was this yeah that's the that's the second thing if i could if i could run with this just while i have it the, uh, so we also the heterocyclic amines is another MRP very prevalent in, in pet food. But to come to that second, this, the thing that people kind of first of all we're talking about very high cooking temperatures here. Um, there is an argument, uh, and we can get to some of the positives about cooking. Okay, there is a couple you know that we can defend it a bit with. Uh, but we're talking about very high cooking temperatures here. You know, um, really treating that meat protein badly. But what people think is that. Okay, so it's very hard to digest meat protein that's been cooked a lot. Okay? Yes. And people think that, okay, your body will take what it needs, but all those undigested particles are still in the system. They don't just evaporate into thin air, and those particles, and the half-digested particles, cause problems for everybody, for humans. Three to eight times more likely to react to uh, undigested proteins. Yes. With these IgE, with that study, and we're finding the exact same thing in dogs where um, partially digested proteins can cause gut irritation. Uh, the body just does not like funny little proteins hanging around. And this is one of the reasons that we think that chicken and beef allergy, I mean, in dogs, in a carnivore, like it should be like a cow being allergic to grass. And we just think, oh, chicken and beef allergy, it's so common. But that should not be a common thing in a meat eater. And so that's one of the reasons that we think that's it, because of the highly antigenic, weird protein that has been presented to them on a daily basis and they say over time on the same food over time is key uh, they can develop uh, an issue with the, with the food. I mean, intolerance it's not so much an allergy I think, uh, yeah. as I understand it though whether it's IgG IgE IgM Ig4 that intolerance can quickly accelerate to a full-blown allergy if the body continues to be exposed ah, to it. Ah, okay, interesting. If you think, uh, as I understand it, when the body starts to mount an immune defense to something, it can become hypervigilant and move it along the scale and it can become a full-on allergy. Interesting, okay. I always thought that the two are different. I, I kind of thought an allergy was something you're born with. It's a, you don't have the enzymes, you're genetically unable to process that protein and you're gonna get sick if you eat it. But you're actually saying that it, that can actually kick into that kind of pathway with enough abuse. Yeah, it's the way the body responds to it and ultimately the end of the curve is autoimmune when the body is so vigilant that it can start to attack its own cells, as in with celiac in human patients. Interesting, yeah. yeah. Uh, what I find with my patients is that very often they'll start with one hypersensitivity to, to, to one problem, but then it will it will get worse. This yeah. is in the histories, because when I, I'm presented with them, they have a dozen hypersensitivities. Chicken and beef is really, really common um, from their, their processed foods, uh, but they'll also be allergic to house dust, they'll be allergic yeah. to pollen. So the, all these two are always there, house dust and pollen. Very dust much and pollen. so, very much so. And these are completely natural things. But pound to a penny, it started with a simple uh, hypersensitivity allergic type system, and then uh, it's, it's bred, it, it has multiplied as that sensitivity. More and more as things, it's like- More a, things in the environment yeah, it's trigger even like even a, responses. A car with a bad issue, it will start developing more and more issues yeah. if you don't fix that one wonky wheel. <laughs> you know, it's exactly you know, it's a glorious start, analogy. Yeah, and, a and I think part of that is that the inflammation caused uh, obviously contributes to leaky gut. And then the more leaky the gut is, the more these uh, foreign proteins can come into the body yeah. and, and the more the body getting, responds to it. And Those it's a terrible junctions cycle. open and suddenly these funny proteins get in. That's red alert for the body because that is the, 
it's the, that is the motorway to the heart and brain. So it's one thing being tolerant, intolerant of things in the gut, but when things start entering the bloodstream, you are going straight to the IgE pathway. Round up the SAS soldiers. This is a hyper alert fatty in the bloodstream. Mm. Uh, that's my very simplistic look at allergy, by mm. the way. I, I, I look at the immune system as an army. I just think about the soldiers they send out, the damage that they do when the battle is on around the gut. That's the inflammation. All the soldiers and tanks are arriving to the scene, causing inflammation and mm. swelling the area. You'd expect when that is about to happen, and the heavier the weapons that the, the, the inflammatory system has to use, the more damage is left. And that's how I think about it. That helps me get through the more complicated conversations. I just play with soldiers in my head. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it all goes back to being a child, really. That I sounds so my, wrong. My thumb with the more complicated <laughs> conversations. That sounds so wrong out of context. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hi, remember you can just order our treats by themselves or the remedies or even our latest new product which is Raw Dry. Just visit our website www.bellaandute.com and click over to the shop and order today.